Cool. Dale, why don't you take center stage yeah. now? Thanks so much for coming. Um, I was kind of intrigued by your talking about the different phases of, of development. You called it phase A, phase B, and then C and D was more. And I was kind of wondering, like, when in those phases you kind of develop the high level requirements, when you develop kind of low level requirements, um, how much industry was involved in different levels, you know, what percent was industry engineers, what percent was NASA engineers in those studies? And I was just wondering if you could expand on that. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, the, uh, the theory is that you do phase A with, as conceptual activity. And when you've gotten your requirements nailed down, you then do a phase B. And that's what we thought we had done. And uh, I think it turned out that the uh, requirements Military requirements came in after phase B had been started. So we actually had to change the contracts with the industry to uh, take into consideration those military requirements. And they were a big change to the requirements. So in that sense, we had some uh, inefficiency in the phase B. Uh, and it was after we began to get the the results of phase B that we realized that we didn't have a system that was going to sell, wasn't going to meet the requirements. So instead of canceling phase B, we finished the phase B because we needed that basic understanding of all of the systems and all of the elements that made up the system. So we finished phase B, but we started some additional phase A's, uh, conceptual activities to, to try to find a, a solution. Uh, and I don't remember how we worked from the recognition of the new configuration back into the Phase B guys. Well, Did we extended Phase B. Oh, that's right. We, we had extended. a Phase B extension to bring that new configuration, NASA's decision that we would go to an external tank. We, we modified the Phase B studies again with, a, with an extension that allowed the industry then to catch up with what was going on. And... Uh, by the time we finished that phase B extension, we had all the requirements in place. We had all of the uh, uh, design under, understood well enough to start phase CD. I think it's pretty amazing that, that with a, a device that was uh, going to do what we wanted to do with the shuttle, go into orbit and come back in and land, the configuration really stayed the same from that point on. It's just amazing that, that we did that well, I think, in in definition, so that when we really started the C and D phase, which is the detailed design, things stayed in place, and that meant all the aerodynamic work that had been done, which is, by the way, the the most aerodynamic work, uh, most wind tunnel testing ever done on a new system, I think, uh, logically, because we were working through the whole Mach number range, and all of the other elemental testing that had gone on. <coughs> Uh, all allowed us to keep the configuration identical from that point. <clears throat> yeah. I know uh, there's been a you know a lot, a lot of talk that seems obvious now in in, uh, in hindsight that the uh, the capsule or the orbiter or what have you should be on the top of the uh, of the launcher to clear it from you know a little debris or debris from the from the uh, fuel tank or or what else. Um, what I'm wondering is, at the time in the early stages, was there ever any talk about about safety issues and putting the orbiter uh, so low on the on the on the ball? Yeah. The stack? yeah, there was. There was a lot of talk with Martin about foam shedding at that time, and uh, during the uh, uh, initial uh, decision process for putting it on the side. We had done studies of, of stacking it in series, and uh, uh, the, it was a weight problem. It was literally uh, an issue of the structural <coughs> weight of the orbiter mounted vertically because of the terrific loads that you get separately on that system. And, uh, and so we s recognized that the uh, side-mounted tank was was uh, going to be a much more economical system. So we had to worry about ice and foam. 
And so we had a lot of discussion with the Martin Company at that time. I think we did a lot of work down at uh, Marshall, too. I like to, uh, that's a very good question. In fact, I'll try to develop some of that thought process as we uh, go along. Uh, the, the key point to make is, is the following, is that should we have challenged the requirements, making the, pay, made the arbiter so big, with the payload base so big, it was very difficult to put that on top. If you made it smaller, you could. The real question, I think, and I was going to ask Dale this question, which is a follow-up to yours, should NASA, once OMB and the White House gave a cost constraint, and once we had the change in the Air Force requirements, should NASA had said, no, we don't want to do it? Mm -hmm. And that, that is really, that is a very fundamental issue in terms of understanding your requirements, because the requirements drove the 14-day turnaround time, the fact that you wanted large pay, payloads, you wanted to get to the payloads, put the arbiter where it was. The fact that you needed a high-performance engine said that you had a lot, a lot of payload in orbit, said that you needed a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen engine to get the highest a specific impulse of the engine, the highest performance. So all that added together, the thermal protection system was basically a glass house, mm -hmm. which was incompatible with material coming off the tank. So there was some, there was some, uh, you might say, some uh, incompatibilities and in requirements. And the question is, should we have challenged those requirements more strongly? That's really the fundamental question. I don't think we should have, but let me ask Dale because it would say what you would have done with the arbiter. I did. I challenged the the, the uh, requirements inside NASA. I never challenged it with the military, but I cha challenged it inside NASA with George Lowe and with Jim Pletcher, and. Uh, their conclusion was that we would not have a manned spaceflight program if we uh, challenged the military requirements. And, and, and then the rest of it followed. But had. your question is a very, very pertinent yeah, question. Sure is. It's a, it's a very key question in today's environment. Of course, you're infinitely smarter after it happens, but you, your, your point's very yeah. well taken. Yeah. Yes? Do we have um, better systems engineering tools now than we did in the 70s, and so if you use today's tools to design shuttles, I think, then well, of would course, would be better. Would, would you have avoided cost overruns and so on? System engineering is better. Yes. Cost estimation, I'm not so sure. I think uh, uh, you know we had the best guys in the country doing cost estimations on the shuttle, and uh, but we missed it probably as much as anything else by just not having those people understand the complexities of operating in space. And uh, I think a lot more is known generally now about the cost of operating in space. I think that the next uh, try at a, uh, you know, a reduction in cost for getting into space will be uh, a much more significant uh, activity I consider cost estimation a part of system engineering, and uh, so it's uh, a lot of it is a much better. Some of it is not. I think. Well, uh, just to, to follow up a little bit, uh, when we designed the shuttle, the Arbiter, we didn't have CAD CAM systems. If you look in the aft end of the Arbiter, it's sort of like the hardest thing you've ever seen because we didn't have a computer data design. If we had had that we probably would have done a much easier job in the, in the aft end of the arbiter and in the mid-fuselage and in the cockpit. Yeah. But, and, and that is systems engineering. So you have much more value. You today have much more valuable tools than we had during the Apollo program and during the shuttle program. But there still is a lot of education you need in systems engineering. And I think yeah. uh, 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 Dr. Hoffman explained the, the, three, the, the famous three-pronged three tri the three triangle, cost, schedule, and performance. And that is a continually continued work in uh, systems engineering. And I always think of system engineering as the guys, the, the people who work across the system with everybody uh, in a, you know, a, a real communication system. And, and it's that kind of communication that does good system engineering, <clears throat> tools or not. OK, anything else? Um, could you talk a little bit about the astronaut office and what they thought during these conversations? Were they in favor of the recoverable, fully piloted booster? Oh, yeah. and, and what were their input on the risk conversations? And yeah. Uh, they were 
uh, aware of it. We had, uh, we kept in touch with the SNUDs all the way through the development program, including the decisions not to have a uh, uh, launch abort system. And uh, they all recognized there was risk in the program, no question about it. Uh, Aaron, you were there. What about it? Well, I think that's right. You said it right. I think that's right. They were involved. We had, they were part of the yeah. design and development team and the requirements team, so they were very much in favor of it. Of course, the, the big issue, which we'll talk more about, is escape systems, and we'll go yeah. into that a little bit. Why don't we have an escape system? And I'm sure when Chris Kraft comes, uh, you can ask him a lot of questions about that. I'm sure he'll have a lot to say about it, but uh, a lot of us will talk about that. But uh, I think the astronauts were, were very much in favor, were very much a part of the design, the development, the requirements in this phase of the program. So they, they were very yeah. much a part of it. They weren't too much uh, in favor of an automatic landing system. I think that's right. That's right. That was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I understand well uh, your uh, lecture, your, the main uh, purpose of uh, the uh, space shuttle was at first to uh, have a low cost access to space in order to uh, continue the space uh, program uh, which uh, has been designed. When, when does it appear cle clearly that uh, it, uh, the space shuttle was, was not a uh, low cost uh, uh, a low cost access no. to space? Was it too, already too late to change uh, program or requirements? Yeah, I think the problem was that uh, uh, that we never got up to flight rate, you know. There were, there were payloads waiting for us, but we never got to flight rate. And if we had gotten to a higher flight rate, operational costs would have been lower. Uh, not enough lower, because we, no matter what we would do, we never would have met our original estimates on operational costs. But as you saw by that inflation uh, story that I had, uh, uh, costs today uh, would be enormously higher than that $10 million estimate that we had in 1970 just because of inflation. Uh, but we never got flight rate, so we didn't ever get to the lower costs. And in the early days, it appears to me, I wasn't there, but it appears to me there was a lot of pressure to get that flight rate up so that the cost per flight would come down. And that pressure got to be instilled into the people at NASA uh, and the industry to where the decision made on that cold day in January or whatever it was on the Challenger, even though there was evidence that those O-rings had leaked in previous flights, the decision was made to launch. And that was, that's a, that's a management policy issue associated with trying to reduce the cost of flight. And uh, so it, that was a bad decision. Uh, Anything else? Uh, Say one other thing on, on cost per flight. You, you, you have to realize when you're dealing with a reusable system, uh, it, it's hard to specify exactly what you even mean by the cost per flight. Uh, you can take the total amount of money you spend on the shuttle program every year and divide that by the number of flights. Right. Well, this year we only had one flight, and it's yeah. a pretty, pretty high cost. And last year the cost was infinite. Um, on the other hand, you can you can look at you know what's the what's the cost of flying six flights a year versus what's the cost of flying seven flights a year, and that's what you would call in economics the incremental cost of a flight. Um, also, you have to realize that in the cost of the flight, there's an awful lot of things that are wrapped up, not just the cost of the shuttle itself, but all of the mission operations, the, oh, yeah. uh, the, the flight planning that has to be carried out. There was one flight, it was a Space Lab flight, I think back in the 80s, where uh, they launched the Space Lab mission. It was supposed to be a, a two-week mission, but they had a fuel cell problem, so they had to come back after four days. And in order to give the scientists the opportunity to get their flight uh, data, they rescheduled the flight for a few months later. So they had the same crew, they had the same flight plan, so they, they didn't have, have all of the 
expenses, the, the paperwork expenses, the, the training, all of the, the replanning, uh, the, the experiments were the same. So it, it was the least expensive flight that we possibly could have, have run. And at the time, the estimates were that that, that actually cost NASA uh, probably about $120 million. So, you know, that was kind of the, 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 the bare bones estimate of, of the incremental cost of a shuttle flight. And, you know, then it can go from there all the way up to, uh, you know, billions of dollars if, if you just take one flight a year and, yeah. and like we had this year, so. Well, the other thought, too, I remember going up to see Dale Myers when he was uh, Associate Administrator for Manned Space Flight, and I was the Orbiter Project Manager. As he pointed out, we had four computers. The original thought, the original thought is that we, if one computer went out on the ground, we would lift off with three computers. And that's what we talked about. But of course, that never happened. I mean, yeah. not only that, we have five computers now. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, we actually have the fifth computer, which is a backup computer. Uh, so, you know, uh, things change, environments change, and we were going to do, we were going to do payloads very routine payloads. Yeah. We were going to take up, launch a payload, and come back down. Just very routine payloads. Almost every payload today is different, and it does take that large yeah. amount of, of infrastructure to get it, to get that. So. Yeah. One of the cost elements in our cost effectiveness study was a reduction in the cost of scientific payloads, because we were going to have a sort of a boilerplate uh, bus, uh, heavy, rugged. Uh, bus that had power and, and communications and the scientists would bring their experiments to this bus, put it on this standard vehicle, take it into orbit, launch it or keep it depending on what the experiment was and bring it back and we were going to have this standard bus that was going to be one of the big improvements in cost of the science payloads. So we showed a reduction in the cost of scientific activity in our cost-effectiveness studies. That never happened. Science guys never could accept the idea of an independent bus. <clears throat> we could go on talking for a long time, but it is the end of the class. Let's thank Dale Myers again. Thank you. Good.